Nettle TV. I'm Phoenix, and we're hanging out today with Gloria Cavalera. We're going to talk to her today about Soulfly, about what it's like to be a woman in the industry, uh, a mother and a wife. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So great Thanks to see you. Me. You too. Uh, one of the first questions I want to ask you is, when you booked your very first show at Bootleggers, did you have any idea at the time that you were embarking upon something that would be a career that would span over decades? No, not at all. It was just, uh, it was actually my brother, Paul, a uh, garage band had come in and asked if they could just play in the corner of the restaurant area. And so Paul pushed back the pool tables. They tucked the band in there one night and the place was packed. And so Paul was like, let's do this more often. And so we started the all ages shows. He he also realized he was like, we're just like Denny's, but with the band. And so we had a division in the middle of the club. So half of it was for the drinkers and the other half was for the the miners and had people that just came in to see the bands. And then we started doing bands every day. But we didn't have a clue. I mean, now when I look back, it, I realize it was like my elementary school. It's where I learned everything. Do you think it was harder to be a woman in the industry when you first started out than, than it is now? No, I think it was easier when I started because everything was fresh. There was a, a big amount of unity among metal. You know, it was like, it was a different time right than right now. I mean, for I guess for a lot of new bands, they would say, oh, no, it's still the same. You know, so maybe it is for them. But I just think, like, uh, music really tightened up. A lot of the women are gone for one reason or another. You know, I mean, there's a lot of new people that I know that are starting to to do well with their, with their bands. So I, I'm kind of hopeful for a couple other women that I know. And also, like, uh, back then, people bought the records, you know, like they would go wait outside the the store two days before, you know, people would call us from England from this record store or from Florida. And they'd say, oh, people have been lined up for this long. And, you know, all of that's gone because now people just line up for the torrent sites, you know, which which really affected music, all all forms of music and all artists all record labels. I mean, that's why there's no no in-stores autograph signings anymore because those were set up for fans to meet the band, but they were set up to sell CDs. So people come in now with things that they've printed off or they'll even bring a burned CD, you know, for, for you to sign. And so it, it really made things difficult for, for artists because things that you used to be able that you knew you know your fans were there to show support to to be fans i mean they you know they are supposed to purchase the music and you know max doesn't steal from his fans he doesn't call a plumber and say hey you're my fan you came here last week can you come and do my plumbing for free for the next year you know what you made enough money you sh plumbing should be free or or walk in an art museum and say, oh, I'm going to just cut out that painting because that's art. That should be free. You know, that like that whole mentality kind of changed music and how, how managers manage and things that band members have to do. You know, they have to do meet and greets now. They have to be very creative to to earn money to properly tour. I mean, I there's so many bands that we have asked to to accompany us to Europe on on support slots who are unable to go because record labels don't give the tourist support anymore. You know, they used to, there used to be a lot more opportunities to get your name out, to market yourself. I mean, people say, oh, now marketing's free. It's online. It's, it's one part of what you need. You still need all the print. You still need whatever TV you can get. You need the radio play. I mean, there's a whole big, big caboodle you need to have every single thing so it, it it made it very different I wouldn't I wouldn't say like I don't want to cast a dark side on anything you just have to learn to do things in other ways you know to to be a musician now but it, it is very frustrating for labels and it's frustrating for artists and I've, I've seen several different bands be disappointed with 
with the work that they put in. I mean, they have to recoup the records and I, it's, you know, they, if they put a, a cheap sound on the record, everybody will complain about that, you know? So it's, it's kind of a circle that needs to be sorted that hasn't been. Would it be safe to say that you, along with Sharon Osborne, uh, Wendy Dio, Maria Ferrero, helped to carve a place in the industry for women managers? I would say Sharon and Wendy, Gloria Butler, for sure for women managers. Maria's new, I believe, to management, maybe in the last 10 years or so, but I think those those three women very much contributed. Susan Silver, too. She did Soundgarden at the time. Right, but, I but I really think Sharon and Wendy and Gloria were really the the front runners who opened the doors. I mean, I, I've always looked up to to every one of them. So I was I was after. I was after them. So what advice would you give to women that are just starting out in the industry? Hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I should say to to go into it. I mean, just really follow your heart, basically. Believe in yourself because if you don't, you know, you have to get a real thick skin to deal with everyone, all the, you know, there's as many compliments that you get, there's more aggression towards you. Like there's very unfair, unfair things are said to women, I believe, that aren't said to men. You know, like if you go on a tour and a man loses his temper, everybody's like, oh, we got to do what he says. But if you go on tour and a woman is like, hey, you need to do this. Some people will just be like, you know, insulting. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. It's because, true. It's true. When was the very first moment that you knew Max was your soulmate? It was on a ferry, and he was went walking by one time. All of a sudden, I was like, "Ding!" But um, and then I think I don't know. I, I I just kind of tended to ignore it at the time. But I I don't know. I mean, he told me that he knew right when he met me because. His family went to a lady who, I don't know what I would call her in particular, someone who like sees things, talks to spirits. She said that he was going to marry a foreigner. So he said the minute he met me, he knew that we were going to get married someday. But with me, I mean, it took a little while. It started out through work, you know, because we were always, he did most of the the work. You know, he he just constructed the artwork. You know, the titles, the f photographers, everything really. And so we were, we started out working mostly together. So that, that just really gave us a lot of time together. And we started realizing like we liked a lot of the same things. So it just occurred naturally, really. Tell us something about Max the man, the husband, the father that few of us get to see. He's a pushover. <laughs> if, if, if the kids want to hear yes for something they know that I will say no to, they will go to him first. <laughs> he definitely, he had a much less strict upbringing than I did. I mean, I had the Russian mom who was in a, the war, you know, and my no-nonsense dad. So I was very much raised, you know, right and wrong, things like that. And he was kind of more like Brazilians are more cultural and artistic, even in their daily lives. So they're more like, ah, it's okay, you know, we can be late and we you know, so I, I think that that made a big difference, really. Um, this is the 19th year since Dana was taken. And every year you guys do a D-Lo show. What does that show mean to you? Well, actually, we started doing it every year because we wanted to to remind everybody how long it took for Dana to get justice. And I remember we were at the cemetery one time, a group of us, and this father whose two sons were buried, or his one son and his son's friend were buried near Dana. He came over and he told us this story about how his son had been 
um, murdered and it took four years. And we were like, four years? It's not going to take us four years. And now here it is 19 years later. And there's still this, this shroud that hasn't fully come off the whole story. So I guess it just shows people a reality that many people don't want to know exists. I mean, change my opinion about some police officers, about justice, about courts, just about how things are handled. And probably every one of our children. I mean, they were all, we were all there through that whole time period. So, And so the Delo show kind of serves to remind people to keep it in the forefront until, until the, the people are caught. Well, I mean, it just shows, I think it just shows now, like, metal kids don't really get a lot of justice. I mean, nobody, the first time something happens, you know, they look, what kind of music did they listen to? Or what kind of shirt was he wearing? Or, right. You know, it just, it signifies a lot more, I think, after existing for 19 years than it would have when we first started. You know, we thought we were going to end up doing like two, three, four shows. You know, but now we really see, you know, like I've I've been very active with, with his case since day one. And it just really shows a different side of the world to me now, you know. Does it does it ever get easier, the loss? Mm -hmm. You know, you you car you put it in a compartment. You know, I always say I have this old fashioned Rolodex in my head and it's just flipping back this way and back and forth all day. And I like as soon as as soon as it happened, like I knew there were things that didn't make sense just in the situation immediately. I knew there were things that didn't make sense. And so I I had to make myself look at it as a case or as a mystery not something that actually happened to Dana. Right. You know, I mean, I... In order to keep... I had to walk through a lot of things that I don't think a parent should have to learn or know or realize or find out or... Or maybe they should should find them all out. And that's why I did. I don't know, you know. But it, it, it changes. You know, it's like a lion. Sometimes it stalks you and sneaks up on you and disappears. You know it's there, but you can't see it. When you look back at Soulfly's career, what do you consider the biggest accomplishment of the band? I think it would have to be all of the territories we've been to, actually. Taking taking Max to the people. That, that was the biggest accomplishment for me personally, and I... I think for Max, too, like, there was a time we were spoiled and, and we were like, oh, we've got to play here, we have to play there. But then I started realizing if we only play and we limit ourselves, put boundaries about where we're going to go, then a lot of his fans won't see him. But okay. Just for the fact that he's third world. Right there, that opened him up to so many countries that, you know, they like other bands for their music or something, but there's something about Max, you know, that they're connected with his lifestyle, how he grew up. So I think that's probably a very big accomplishment. I mean, we've also introduced many young artists to the world who were overlooked and went on to do great things, you know. That's then, always amazing when you can nurture another really, artist. We've really done that with a lot of the people who've been, you know, with Soulfly. And nearly all are, are very, very close friends with us. I can't think of a better musical mentor than Max, honestly. Yeah, he's so true. versatile. He's so genuine. Yeah. And he Very loves patient. music. I mean, he lives music. That's and for loves sure. music. <laughs> it's his girlfriend. <laughs> it's his girlfriend. The one you the one you're not worried about, right? <laughs> I always know where he is. <laughs> um what is the one thing you would like to see Soulfly accomplish in the future? I guess to play in the Middle East would be the only thing that I haven't really done that I dreamt of to do a show. And actually, like in the last day or two, I've been contacted by a radio station in Cairo. 
Wow. So he's going to do his first radio interview Saturday. That's going to go all through the Middle East. So I'm very excited about that. And that will open many doors, I'm sure. I just think, you know, like those people, they they could use some religious freedom and they could use some freedom to be youth. And if you happen to be born in some country where someone doesn't like metal, they should still allow you the choice to go through that period of your life and be young and and experience experience like everyone else does. I always remember when we played in Moscow, uh, we did the first tour of any band in Russia once it was free. Like they had done the Moscow Peace Festival, but right after that, we went and we were there for 10 days. We traveled on the trains. We played, we were the first band to play the different countries of Latvia, Lithuania. You know, we we traveled around on the trains and the gentleman who eventually bought MTV Russia, his first name was Boris, very wonderful person. He traveled with us and he did the show. We we were paid in rubles, like we gave them to the gypsies. And there was, we had to have armed guards outside our rooms because like the war was over, people were eating out of garbage and you know, freedom is just like one step up from where we where we came in at. So that that was very and, and at the end they had a dinner and Boris said, Thank you for giving the the fans in Russia the chance to feel like an American. Just That's waiting amazing. for the show, buying the ticket, everything that led up to it, talking about it with their friend. It really hit home with me, you know. And so I've kind of made it my my thing to go everywhere and i believe that when max is touring these places the music is giving them freedom it is even not permanent freedom but it is giving them freedom for the moment for the time that they get the ability to enjoy it it's very true we're all connected through his music i mean really you know i've on i've got so many people now that i know in iran pakistan afghanistan syria even people on Facebook who I'm friends with now, and I've, I've learned really a lot. I mean, they they straight up have a law that metal is Satanism, which it's not. Correct. Right. So, you know, just like I think countries should be more modern in this, this age of the world. I agree with that, and, and I, I agree with that. And I think that this is definitely a opportunity to embark upon that. It's true. true music. It's true. Are you sick and tired of being asked about a Sepultura reunion? I very rarely get asked. <laughs> but Max is very sick of it. <laughs> I guess you could say that. I mean, yes, it it won't happen. The reunion for Max was with his brother. And, and that was the reunion of our family again. And it was very meaningful and I I believe in Max's art and in his heart. I know that everything he does, he does from his soul. And there's no, he's very satisfied with what he did in Sepultura and he doesn't try to recreate the past. He creates the future. I think Max's career in, in the evolution and when you look at the different bands, they're, they are not similar. These are all different extensions of Max's musical talent. And they're all different. Tell us a little bit about the new Soulfly CD, um, Archangel. What you is something great favorite? What's your favorite about it? Mm, just the whole overall concept. It it was very meaningful for Max to to make that record. He has a his religion this year is the year of Saint Michael. And so it was it was very important to him when he was putting out Soulfly 10 that he related it to to his life. You know, a lot of his records are really about Max's life, what's going on around him at the time in the world, in our house, personal things. And uh just the whole the whole concept to see him working so hard, like, you know, I, I always have my questions i'm a libra so i'm always like what if this or that or not and 
And then he was like, you know, don't worry. I'm just telling Bible stories, you know, old stories from the Old Testament. But I, I was a little, you know, like, how are the fans going to going to do this? But then when I saw the cover, I mean, the cover was just like, this whole thing is meant to be. And he was just so sure of himself. And everybody loves it. We can't wait to go out and play it on the road. I mean, everyone did a great, great job on that record, you know. Working with Matt Hyde was was very educational and and just very cool. It was very cool. The whole his whole package, his group, his studio, the people that work with him, it was just really very positive the entire way. So all the different when nails when Todd mm -hmm. from nails, I mean, he scares your heart out. It's just like God's talking, you know. It's really. It's really exciting, I think. When you look back on your career, is there anything that you wish you had done differently? Not really. I feel like I'm at a really good place. I'm super peaceful with myself. I'm comfortable in my skin. I just, I don't feel like I really did anything that I want to change, to be honest with you. It was all, I'm kind of one of those, like, I believe when you're born, like, your path is already carved, and hopefully you see it while you're walking on it. So I don't, I don't really turn back time much. Just move forward. Just move forward. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We Thank really you, appreciate thanks. it. Thank you for tuning in to Fee Metal TV. Make sure to pick out the new, the new Soulfly CD, Archangel. Stay tuned. Stay metal.